Please join me in welcoming today's guest speaker, Ms. Jessica Campesino. Jessica is an instructional designer at Florida International University's Herbert Wolfian College of Medicine. What motivates her as an educator is seeing the light bulb go off over someone's head, helping them finally grasp a concept or technique that has eluded them for so long through classroom and virtual training, one-on-one -on -one coaching, and online programs. She has helped people leverage technology to achieve more. So, Jessica, as I mentioned, I am a medical student for today. Please come to the rescue. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you for that introduction, Tom. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here uh, to share a little bit of what we learned and to have a little bit of fun, right? You know, it is spooky season. It compels us to do things, right? Uh, so that's, um, I, I'm thankful for all of y'all's time today. So uh, to kind of jump right into what we're we're discussing, and I, I did share a link for some references and resources that you can review on your own. I think one of the biggest questions that came up uh you know, as you registered and, and you guys submitted some questions was getting that stakeholder buy-in. How do we convince people that this is the right thing? We may know, right, that this gamification process or that this process works, right? But how do we actually get other people to believe us, right? And, you know, some I, I would just address that in a sense that, you know, it's it's also partnering with them and realizing that they have their realm of expertise and we have our realm of expertise and together right we can really bridge that gap uh, and so i think that you'll see that along the presentation um if there's any burning questions feel free to drop them in the chat i will uh go ahead and address them so i'm gonna go ahead and share my presentation slides Okay, so what are we talking about today? We're talking about using digital escape rooms uh, to create an, you know, uh, immersive learning experiences that are engaging. Now, this was specifically used for medical students, but if you, are, you have nursing students, if you have a residence, right, these are all audiences that are suitable for anything like this, right? Uh, a little bit about me. So I am a first gen college student, first gen American daughter of immigrants, right? Raised in Miami, Florida. I'm a huge fan of technology and what it can do to help really engage us and extend our learning experiences and help us interact with content in interesting ways. My background is in strategic communication, but I've played teacher since I was in second grade. I graduated this summer with my master's degree in education and I'm teaching for the first time, uh, the first year experience class this fall. So uh, this has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Now, I did hear a young author recently say that we stand on the shoulders of giants. So these are my giants. Uh, Dr. Lemus uh, was the faculty developer at the time of that we initiated this project, and she taught a course for fourth year medical students that were interested in teaching. And together, we designed this framework for a virtual escape room learning experience on patient safety. Ian, who was our a student at the time, consulted with Dr. Coronel uh, on patient safety, like the content itself. And he developed an outline for what he thought the escape room experience could be and the content that he could have. I was engaged more in making the logistics of it work, right? So develop getting the 360 degree image so that it was more immersive, uh, kind of thinking through the parts and the tech and how that would particularly work. And then Dr. Lemus, she assisted in uh, helping our faculty member develop the pre and post assessment, uh, and as well as the learning objectives, right? So this was all delivered as an intervention during a third year internal medicine clerkship uh, didactic session, which is currently, I think, now about in its fifth rotation that we, we've been doing this. And I think what I wanted to really shout out in this particular instance is that it takes a lot more than just one person, right? It's developing uh, this experience with a diverse group of people that have expertise in either the subject matter and pedagogy and in technical knowledge, right? Uh, so I think that's my big takeaway for this is you don't have to do it alone if, you know, um, the support systems might look different at different institutions. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that's the big takeaway for me is definitely reach out and get support where you can uh, and, and bring those diverse group of people together. And I think one of the biggest aspects of this was having the student, you know, kind of create that. So co-design, right? Co-designing with people and something that was useful for them. Okay, so in terms of 
what are we getting out of today? My hope is that we'll be able to define what an escape room is, if that's not something you're familiar with, and how it can be used in educational setting, settings specifically. Uh, some of the briefly review some of the benefits that we've seen, uh, and then actually get to showcase uh, the educational escape room uh, that we did uh, in specifically in patient safety and why, right? And then I wanted to focus a little bit of time to at the end was to how we actually built and implemented the escape room uh, and kind of give you a little bit of a toolkit that you might be able to use uh, to kind of start the conversation like this. These are the tools that we need or whether you need free and low cost stuff or whether you have a little bit more of a budget and can implement something. So I like to call it like the hoopty, the sedan and the luxury vehicle options. Right. So what do we have if we have only like, you know, $50? Like, how, what can we do with that? And what could we do if we had more? OK, so to get us started, if I could ask you all um, and thank you, everybody, while you guys are, while I'm talking, uh, continue to introduce yourselves if you hadn't yet. It's nice to see a familiar face. Hi, Heidi. <laughs> uh, so what do you guys think about when you hear the word or the term escape room? Uh, and if anybody has actually done an escape room before, what was that experience like? Okay, so solving puzzles, yes. Zork, I assume that's a movie, lol. Uh, immersive experience, problem solving, puzzles, panic. <laughs> you know, Abby, that's very interesting that you brought that up because there is kind of this sense of urgency. And I remember I had a faculty who's like, can we take the timing element out? Like there's already like too much uh, pressure on these students. I'm like, you can, but know that in an escape room, it's supposed to be time bound. Like you're supposed to have that sense of urgency and needing to solve something quickly, right? Uh, teamwork, absolutely. Um, it sounds complicated. It can be, right? Fun, challenging, solving puzzles as a team within a time limit. Yeah, Catherine. Thrilling. It, yes, intriguing. It was good. Good. Okay. Escape rooms are fun team building. Absolutely. It can be fun or it can be like, you can show your personalities real quick. Like, like, like who is going to take over and dominate or who is going to like be that more that collaborative partner along the way, right? Critical thinking skills, yes. Zork is an interactive fiction computer game. Oh, cool. And building trust. Lauren, that's a really good way to, I think, to end this particular piece, right? You know, because you have to work together to solve the puzzles and get out of the room. It either builds trust or it can break it, right? So we hope that it builds it and not breaks it. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Okay, so this is just a quick image. Um, if you have experience in escape room, this should look similar. Typically, you get thrown inside of a room and you you have to kind of look around and, you know, kind of explore the room. And as you explore the room, you encounter puzzles. One thing leads to the other. And then, you know, maybe you get a key or a clue or an unlock code or something and you're able to enter the answer. And now you get the next clue. Right. So it's supposed to be a series of clues that help you unlock different parts of that room, right? And then ultimately you get the key to get out the door. So if you've done one in person, that's very similar. Now, how do we do that in more of a digital space, right? Uh, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. But yes, so the basics, live action, team-based games where you discover clues, solve puzzles and accomplish tasks. So sometimes you're asked to complete something. Right. Um, and then it does absolutely like some of you have already pointed out, encourages that teamwork and drives that participation and motivation, which we have seen is way more effective than being talked to. Right. You know, for, for an hour. Um, OK, so there are some uh, QR codes throughout the presentations. It's already available at the end in the Google Doc if you need to. But this particular QR code kind of tells you where I got that from. Um, if you're interested in scanning that and, and reading it that way, or just get the Google Doc link at the end, that's, that's fine too. So what, what are we talking about when we're talking about like learning experiences and specifically within gamification? So it's actually drawing for, from multiple learning theories. So we're looking at experiential theory, right? So we're creating an experience, right? That offers that opportunity to reflect, to conceptualize the reinforcement theory, right? So we're creating rewards and consequences as a way to motivate uh, use and learning. So video games, if if you're if you're a gamer, I'm an avid gamer, they do a really good job of incentivizing you to keep learning, right? And so that's what we're trying to do in more of a learning setting is how do we incentivize that? Maybe for some people, they might be incentivized by leaderboards and being like the top or the first group to get out. Uh, social comparison theory. And so that's forcing that self-evaluation of knowledge gaps. Okay, and we've seen that also like in, you know, team-based exercises or um, if TRATs, if you guys do uh, the 
team quizzes and stuff like that. So it's supposed to like help each other and, and, you know, even think about innovative or creative ways to solve problems because you also have a diverse group of people. Right. Um, so what there's mainly three areas or three forms of game-based learning. So we have what we, what we think of, which is gamification, right? So you're using game elements within non-gaming contexts, right? So if you're using a leaderboard within a particular game made for learning, that might be gamification. And then the other two types would be more simulation. So you're using some game design techniques to create a simulated reality, but they're not actual game elements, right? Uh, and if you think of a pilot, they might be in a simulation, right? Not quite an actual you know, plane, but they're in a simulated plane. And then serious game. So that is, a, is you're creating a game to address a real world topic. And I've seen examples of that where there was an entire like kind of um, game built out in VR and it's supposed to teach empathy because you're a person without resources, you don't have money, you're trying to, and you're trying to feed your kid and like it's supposed to create empathy for, you know, low socioeconomic um, instances and, and the um, social determinants of health. So that's a serious, serious game. So we're somewhere in between here uh, in gamification. And then, um, and so the, I think the bigger idea here is we see a lot of uh, myriad of intersections between gaming and learning, right? And if you were, okay, so this is like an interaction point here. If you want to pause for a second and take a look at this slide, and if there's one or two particular uh, features, right, uh, that you really, really like about gamification and learning, um, or maybe something that you think is critical, let me know in the in the chat. So we're looking at engagement, um, and how we might do engagement, right, within gaming and learning. So we might use a, an immersive story, right, um, uh, assessment, right? Are you looking to do some sort of knowledge check or, you know, check off content mastery, uh, collaboration, you know, that teamwork piece that you guys identified earlier, right? Uh, practice, right? The ability to practice and repeat um, active learning, right? We're making sure it's something that's active and then feedback. So Lauren says feedback practice. Uh, every engagement and practice, yes, objectives. <laughs> Those are still critical, regardless of what you're building, right? Engagement and active learning, yep. Uh, collaboration, active learning, low stakes opportunity, immersive storytelling, Heidi. Yes, I, you know, I love stories. Yeah, I love the idea of putting content into context to engage students in the story. Yeah, I, I, Heidi, I absolutely agree. I think, um, one of the pieces that was missing when we initially started this project was kind of that story. I was like, okay, but like, you know, the, the student came up with like, okay, you're, you're stuck in a room and it's like, okay, well, why are they stuck in the room? And, you know, what is their incentive to get out? Right. Uh, and we'll, we'll show you guys that what we came up with, you know, it doesn't have to be elaborate. It just has to make sense. Right. Uh, role playing. Yeah. Role playing. Mm -hmm. That could also be part of the, the engagement. Yeah. Engagement and collaboration. I think, I think I agree though, that the teamwork really makes a difference. Okay. So ultimately, at the end of the day, so games are essentially just puzzles to solve, right? You know, whether it's, you know, if you think about driving a car or playing an instrument, right? These are puzzles that you're solving. We are humans, our pattern identifying machines. We learn the underlying patterns, we master them, we store them, and we hope, right, that the simulation or the game that we're playing is relevant enough that we are able to later recall that information, right? So that's what we're trying to drive to, right? And in the act of solving the puzzles, we, we, we have fun, right? And that's also the point we're having fun, which is so, so good for learning. Uh, and then what's also great is that that experience can be shared, which also also requires your communication, your problem solving, and even engaging any prior knowledge and experience, right? So that's how we kind of see the intersection between these two. Okay. So let's get into like what we did and how we did it. Uh, we specifically chose a topic, uh, patient safety for this. And why did we choose patient safety? So the reason is that medical errors are a leading cause of injury in the US. So that's the big idea. That's the big problem that we were trying to solve. Uh, and we sought to develop students' knowledge of patient safety and its relationship to being a competent medical professional, right? So we want to build their professionalism. At the same time, uh, we want to make sure that, you know, they're able to effectively communicate. So ultimately, if there is a patient safety issue, the idea is that they would notify or fill out a report, an incident report about that particular issue. So we're, whereas we're trying to build the awareness of how to identify the, the drivers of harm, we also want to instill the idea, okay, but it's 
it's, you know, it's part of your job to, you know, take it a step further and, and actually fill out this report. So uh, it's a commitment to continuous improvement and quality of care, right? Uh, and then as part of that, it's important to just reduce medical error and increase safety. So these were kind of like the, the medical reasons or the medical curriculum reasons, right? And then I think the biggest one is building the effective habits for students who are going to be entering graduate medical education training, right? And one of those habits is identifying these drivers of patient harm of patient harm and then developing the confidence, right, to actually do something about that, right? And so I think this came from uh, our instructors. Uh, she's like, I didn't know anything about patient safety until I was in resident training. And I want to make sure that my students don't experience the same thing. Like they're able to identify it and they're able to do something about it uh, ahead of time. And so when they come in, they're not coming in with another gap. They're coming in already caring about uh, continuous improvement and all of that. Okay. So that's kind of the why on the medical side. In terms of what else drove this engine to create, we also looked at uh, contextual environmental factors uh, driving the project, right? So undergraduate medical education curriculum is heavily focused on the basic science as it should and clinical experiences. So there was uh, less opportunities to raise awareness on patient safety and quality improvement principles. It's kind of limited, even though we, we do know that it's integral, right, to the healthcare. Uh, and in addition to that, there's also this rapid shift at the time to remote instruction, of course, during the pandemic that helped kind of accelerate and pick things up in terms of that digital transformation. Um, and we've also seen uh, medical schools increasing their active learning and reducing their lecture-based learning over the last 10 years. Uh, it's now supported, right, that student learning outcomes are enhanced by active learning because it increases student engagement and also helps manage the student's cognitive load, right? So we know that by reducing cognitive load, we can maximize the learning and aid in the long-term retention of information. We know all this. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, right? But these are all like the reasons why. And then lastly, gamification, right? A strategy that helps drive engagement and motivates learners and can help also reduce uh, that cognitive load, right? So these were all the other driving factors. So if you need, you know, your how do I get my stakeholders? Here's a few reasons as to why we're doing this and why we did this. And that might that might help kind of carry that conversation. So here's a preview of the room. I'm going to actually like pop out in a second and, and click around a little bit. But if you'll notice, it's it's a it's a digital escape room, which was developed and delivered during that third year of the internal medicine clerkship um, session. Right. We use the tool called ThingLink with a 360 degree image of a simulation room. And we got a standardized patient. Uh, if you see them there. Uh, they were actually a, an SP that was hired for that particular shot. Uh, so what we do is we placed props in the room. We had medication vials, a procedural tray, uh, and then we had the students uh, work together during the session. And, and this was digitally via Zoom, uh, access the thing link, uh, and then work together in groups to collect the clues. And they had to do that within 20 minute, a 20 minute time frame, right? So in creating this experience, we applied some typical game characteristics, right? Where the simulation provided some clear rules that they that they had to follow in terms of like, you know, collecting a certain amount of clues. So each clue that they collected gave them a letter. And then as they collected the 10 clues, the letter spelled out a particular phrase. And then that's what they needed to enter in at the end in order to get out of the room, right? Uh, so we use these type of game mechanics to motivate the player to engage, right? We use a leaderboard uh, and I'll show you, it's not like a fancy leaderboard at all. We had them enter into a Google form and then we shared the spreadsheet and the timestamp of the leaderboard was it, right? Uh, and then we used like those visual aesthetics where we had a real image of, of a room with the props and a standardized patient and then with the narrative. Okay, so without uh, much further ado, let me exit this for a second. And I can actually show you what that looks like. So this is my demo, uh, which is a little bit less uh, fancy than, than the fuller one. But you'll see there's thing like you're able to use a 360 degree image and you can kind of click and move around the room. Uh, and then what we did is we created kind of like this standalone home button, which is kind of like the start here. And basically this is where, yeah, this is what happens when you move out of Google, when your institution decides Google isn't a thing anymore. Right. But essentially what it would do is it would go into um, the a presentation that talks about the story and how that got there. And then along the way, we created some clues, right? We had close-ups or we found like, you know, stock images of different things. Uh, so sorry, there's no clue here, but it might be a good idea to have some of these around, right? So 
even though they were clicking on something that was meant to distract them, it was also carrying a message with them, right? So you'll see that in some of that. And then in these clues, right, there's, there's this one actually leads to something else. This is, hey, there's a handwritten list of the patient's home medications, find the medication list located somewhere in this room. So it's a clue that leads to another clue. Uh, now, I know that with something uh, a little bit more advanced, like Storyline, you can make this more linear where you have them click on one thing and then it allows them to click on something else. Thinglink, I mean, it was like 60 bucks a year. So this is something that um, you could do a workaround where you only have like one or two clues on one scene and then you have them click into one and it goes into another room. So that allows, allows it to make it a little bit more linear. So the, our workaround was to kind of just throw a bunch of interactions and that way like it forced them to kind of have to click into everything. So then this is the actual inpatient printed medication list. Um, and then the idea is that they would actually, let me know what, let me go into the live one that might be a little bit less janky here. Okay, so here's the, the escape room, right? So it kind of walks through the story. You've been placed in rotation. You need it's Friday night, okay, before your three day weekend. You need to get a history from one last patient. Uh, your your battery is low, okay. You find the patient. You enter the room. You begin the history, okay. Then there's a power surge, right? You, typically in these narratives, there's always something that goes wrong, right? And it could be as spooky or as lighthearted as you want it to be, right? Uh, so now you need, and then of course there's a keypad on the door, but you don't know what the code is. So the point is to find the clues in the room to help you unlock the the code, right? And so of course your battery is now dead. You have no option but to figure out how are you going to get out of this room, right? Uh, there's a voiceover that says that you have 20 minutes. Okay, so this is all part of that narrative piece that tells this is why you're here. This is why you need to get out of the room, right? So investigate the room, and then it goes to here's the rules, right? You have 20 minutes. Somebody share their screen. You know, once you identify an issue, you know, you'll be asked a question to complete it or to complete an activity, right? And then you're able to begin. So that's the narrative piece of it that at least helps to drive why. There was another narrative idea, which I thought was really cool. Basically to create the, in like have 3D images of the, your, your body. So basically you get swallowed as like something you're like, and then you have to navigate throughout the body and each scene is a different part of the systems inside, right? So it can be as creative as you as you want. Um, and then so you see here, there's all these different kind of interaction points, right? Some of them are, are fake kind of distractors and some of them are actual ones. So here's one, uh, a printed medication list. It goes through just some questions on Google Forms, right? What's the correct answer? Right. And then as they answer these questions, they get a tip in terms of, you know, what we want them to learn about medication errors. Right. So they answered a question and they answered it correctly. They've unlocked a clue. Now they need to make note of the letter. Right. And so this is where the, the collaboration comes in. You have one person sharing the screen, another person writing down what the clues are, and everybody is talking about what the answers are. Right. And even if they get it wrong, the whole point is to go back and reattempt it. Right. Because if they get it wrong, so I'm going to go back to this one. The idea is that they're going to get asked it again. Right. So they have kind of unlimited attempts with but keeping in mind that they have 20 minutes. Right. So that's one example, a little bit more of an interactive one. So that's just a kind of a straightforward multiple choice question uh, is something more like this one. Um, Geni I use Genially for this, right? Which has a little bit more of a visual, a little bit more of aesthetics, right? Uh, and then this is focused on, uh... yeah, okay, great. The list, uh, so that's perfect. I did use Genially for some of this. So thing link as like as a way to kind of house everything and then I use uh, Google and uh, Genially to kind of create some more interactivity. I would also recommend H5P. They have, a, there's a free uh, H5P editor through Lumi Foundation uh, where you can basically create all of this stuff, you know, for free. You just basically try it out. Um, and I'll, that is should be shared already in that Google Doc. Uh, we can talk tech in a little bit. Uh, but this is just a, an interaction that was built. So it was built in Genially and then linked inside of the thing link, right? Uh, and this is to help kind of talk about patient communication, you know, how to actually appropriately respond to someone that doesn't want to give you the information because they already gave it to somebody else. Uh, and then they unlock a clue, right? Um, and they get 
another clue and another take home tip, right? So that, hey, the community, this is what's important about communication, patient communication. Now, of course, a, a pre-quiz and post-quiz was done on these particular topics aligned to the learning objectives, right? Which was a challenge in and of itself to get there, but we did. Uh, and then, uh, so this is just an example of, of the GLA, right? And then at the very end, and then here's another one you can kind of see, um, this is more of a drag and drop kind of situ situation. There's, uh, we notice that there's a pressure ulcer, you know, you need to apply the dressing, right? And then it gives it a, a few seconds and then you're able to kind of see uh, the take home point because generally you can time it. So like you don't get like the button to continue right away. Uh, it gives it a few seconds before you get the next button to be able to get the clue, right? The idea is we're trying to kind of incentivize the reading to still happen, right? And then at the very, very end, once they've collected all those clues, uh, you'll see that there's a little star at the end, and this is basically how to escape the room. So they would um, enter their team's names and unscramble the word, right? Because the word is like they might be unscrambled, unscramble the word and entered in all caps. And then once they enter that, we know uh, it, it actually has, val Google has validation. So it tells you if you know, you need to re-enter it because it's not correct or not. Uh, and then that way, you know that they entered the correct the correct word. So that in a nutshell was was basically what we use. So we used kind of a combination of, of thing link as a way to house all of our links. Uh, sometimes they were simple multiple choice questions inside of a Google form. So we captured that data in terms of like the questions that they were struggling with. And sometimes they were a little bit more of a visual aesthetic like this one where you're actually kind of doing or your students are doing something with that particular information, right? Um, and they kind of need to click around and figure out like what they need to do. And, you know, this is basically a silence the alarm. I, I have the, the, the web browser off, but now you can hear the alarm, right? So this was a, a kind of a patient safety issue. If you don't hear an alarm, you know, what should you check, right? So ignoring alarms can result in avoidable patient harm. No alarm should be ignored, right? Uh, so those are kind of the take home tips that we did. Okay, so now that I've kind of shown you what we did, let's talk about kind of where do we go from, from or how do we even get here, okay, uh, to implement something like this? Actually, let's do results first, right? So this, these were the results, okay? I got ahead of myself. I got excited about talking about the tech. So overall, we did see an improvement in the pre and post quiz from 73 to 82%. Uh, we also saw roughly about 99 students for the class of 2023. Uh, so it's about 100 students actually completed this. In, and this was all done through Zoom uh, in breakout, uh, breakout groups. There were 10 pre and post questions, right? They focused on hand washing, fall prevention, medication reconciliation, common medical errors, alarm fatigue, like we just saw, the pressure sore stage one, medical vial labeling and patient communication. So these were the more critical uh, drivers of patient harm and, uh, that, we, that we identified or that our faculty identified. And then um, we were able to make those questions, right, and, and integrate them throughout. We did see that there was a significant improvement in particular on the question on hand washing, on uh, pressure sore treatment, and then medication about labeling questions. So those had the most improvement overall. Uh, and if I, you know, if you could see the chart, you would see that the, the pre-quiz was a lot more um, distributed throughout, you know, between like 50% to like 100%. And then once we saw the post-quiz, you saw that changed a lot to be more like 70, 80% and up only, right? So there was definitely an improvement on, on that end. And I think probably, obviously, the 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 one that value is valuable the most to me, right, is the student feedback. You know, they found that it was a fun, interactive. It was a novel Zoom experience for them. Uh, they thought it was well organized and a well informed session, right? So they actually really enjoyed it. They thought it was different. Uh, they and I got to be like the fly on the wall for a few of the groups and just kind of like hear them interacting and okay, well that's not it. What have you tried this, right? Uh, so that that was really rewarding to see on that. And so there was engagement, there was communication, there was collaboration, there's critical thinking happening, all of those skills, right? Okay, so here's where we get uh, into the tech piece, right? So you you could uh, potentially do something that's very low cost, no cost, right? Uh, H5P, you can use that through Lumi uh, Foundation. Uh, they have something uh, that you, well, I was trying to annotate it, but it was giving me a hard time, right? So H5P here, uh, Lumi Foundation, uh, they are, they have a like 360 tour and you can download Lumi for free or use their cloud version and you can create something like, you know, completely for free. Now, obviously free, me, 
means you're not going to get the most amount of customization. But if you wanted to try something, you could. Uh, I used a combination of um, Google Forms, right? Now we're a Microsoft institution. So I switched a lot of what I could over to um, to Google Forms or to Microsoft Forms. So we used Google and then ThingLink, they have, a, they have an annual teacher subscription for $35, right? Uh, and then Genially is $60. So these, um, these are, while they are optional, this is what we used. Uh, so we still think it kind of falls under that low cost uh, option. And then we had also a subscription to uh, Adobe Stock, which has stock 360 images. If you don't have a 360 camera, if you do have a 60, a 360 camera, obviously you can create your own experiences. Uh, we actually found that we didn't have um, a 360 camera for the initial of this project. So we borrowed one. We found somebody on campus that had a 360 degree camera uh, and we went ahead and we borrowed it. It was an Insta360. So it, we paid zero dollars by borrowing it from another department in our institution. Uh, ultimately, we, done, we did purchase our own uh, and that was a Rico Theta uh, 360 camera, and that was $300, right? So it's operated through an app on your phone, and then you have the tripod with the camera that takes the 360 image. Uh, we also did have our own in-house team, right? So that may be different depending on your institution. So we had, um, you know, the the labor, so to speak, right? We had the labor for free of multimedia and design. So we had my multimedia person photoshopped the camera out of the 360 image for me, right? Um, so not, that was definitely a privilege. Um, so we did no external hiring for this. If you're contemplating doing something more advanced, like VR, a VR experience or something like that, obviously you would need to consider the cost of hiring someone. You might need a 3D programmer and all that stuff. But you know, for our instance, we kept it low cost, no cost as much as possible. Uh, if you have an LMS, we actually ended up use, using Canvas. We just inserted the link inside our Canvas tool. Uh, you can use that, but you can also just share the link to the thing link or whatever it is that you use. Uh, so that's kind of the, the tech uh, piece of what we did. Um, are there, before I continue, or are there any comments or questions on the tech pieces? I know this one tends to be the most like, if I wanted to implement this, <laughs> how could I actually do this? And I'll just pause here for a second. I do see a couple questions in the Q&A. Thank you for submitting. Did the instructors develop the clues or did you do that from the learning materials? Lauren, excellent question. So there was um, uh, the student who we co-designed this experience with initially came up with the content for what, like what patient safety um, items we were going to put. And um, then they partnered with our faculty member to come up with the questions that they wanted to ask. And then they partnered with the faculty developer to make those questions, 10 questions for the pre and the post quiz, right? Now, the and I'm gonna, this was like one of the things that we learned, right? The very first time that we did this, uh, I didn't get those pre and post quiz questions and those learning objectives until almost the end of developing the escape room. So I had to go back into the escape room. I know, I know. <laughs> I had to go back and align the pre and post uh, quiz questions and the learning objectives to uh, that first iteration. So we learned, right? We learned together that uh, it, it made more sense to develop the learning objectives first, right? <laughs> we all learned <laughs> that day. Uh, so good question. So I think it was a team effort in terms of the student identifying some things in terms of the, yeah, backwards design, exactly. In terms of the faculty developer kind of coaching the faculty member to come up with the, the learning objectives and the quiz questions. So yeah, excellent, excellent question. Heidi, you use solely Google products. Yeah, main pl platform is Google Slides and we place images and icons and use internal links to link things together. Yes, exactly, uh, exactly. You could definitely go super no cost with that. Uh, Lauren, does ThingLink integrate with Canvas for grading purposes? Um, I don't believe that it does. We use this in a strictly formative way. Um, does the group work on their own during the simulation or can the instructor intervene and provide some guidance? So I think you can do both, right? You know, so we had uh, the breakout rooms where the students worked in the group on their own. And then personally, I attended as many sessions as I could and I would come around and I would just be a fly on the wall and just be like, hey, I would guide them if there was like a little technical issue, but I wasn't, you know, providing any other guidance. Uh, they were able to get through it without really much guidance. Um, they had 20 minutes to do it. And then they kind of talked about, you know, what they struggled with. So there was, there was enough 
questions that it was a challenge to get through the 20 minutes, but it wasn't, the questions weren't so challenging that it was impossible to complete. Um, can thing like be embedded into a Canvas assignment? Yeah, so this so this is an interesting question. So I th what we did is we just put the link to the thing link inside of a module that unlocked at a certain time. So that way they couldn't access the thing link module uh, until the appropriate time for that particular session. Kind of another thing that we that we did as well is we uh, changed the clues. So we have like two or three versions of this. So that way the following year when the next uh, cohort comes in, they don't just get the answer from the previous cohort. So that was uh, that was kind of an interesting uh, thought, something that we have to think through. Okay, like we don't want anybody just having the answer and just like skipping over the whole process, right? Uh, so we have to think about that as well. Uh, how much total time did it take to prepare? Ooh, okay, great question. So I think that um, initially it took us about three months. Let me let me get through this part, right? Initially it took us about three months to get through from the whole con concept to initial initial draft piece of that, right? Um, once we once we did the initial, then it was every few months we would kind of revisit it and see, okay, what can be improved? What feedback did we get from last time? Because you know every, the rotation happens every few months, right? Uh, what did we learn from last time? What did we need to change that's different? And we've made less and less tweaks, you know, over over time. Uh, it is it is a continuing ongoing process, right? So we want to continuously improve just as we're asking our students to use continuous improvement uh, in identifying patient, you know, patient harm or patient uh, safety issues. We also wanted to kind of keep looking at it. We don't have to change it every time, but if there's something that we can improve, we, we do. For uh, for instance, there was one uh, where it showed uh, an interaction showed the timer countdown, like you have a minute to complete this task. And the students were like, no, absolutely not. We hate that one minute timer, <laughs> even though they, they still completed it in less than a minute, right? Uh, it was that added pressure. Okay, so we removed that one for the next time. We didn't add the timer. Uh, so it was, it was three months initially, probably. And I think... I don't know if I have a picture, but I have like a white giant whiteboard where I just, okay, if I used Articulate Storyline, here's how I would map this. If I use Google, this is how I would use it. If I, I had to kind of think through what are the possibilities in the tech, right? Uh, I think that probably took the longest amount of time. Yeah. Uh, so the Google form was where the teams responded to the questions. And yes, yes. The Google form or the Microsoft form um, were, was where we responded. Excellent questions. Okay. I have one more, one more set of, of slides in terms of what we learned here, and then I'll come back to the Q&A. But thank you, Tom, for, for facilitating the, that piece. Okay, so in terms of the takeaways, what we actually learned, even though I shared a few of these already with y'all, right? We learned, <laughs> as I shared earlier, that alignment is absolutely critical. We want to make sure that you have clear learning objectives, and preferably those objectives are available uh, before uh, you build, right? Um, there was a little bit of retrofitting that had to happen. Um, and don't worry, Michelle, I will share the link again for the for the Google document um, in, in a second. And then in terms of uh, timing, right? We, we did have some time constraints. We wanted, uh, when they initiated this conversation, we had about three months to, to complete it. So it's like, okay, do or die, let's go. Let's, let's figure something out. What's the quickest way we can get this up? and still allow for that flexibility where we need to make changes to happen, right? Um, that's one of the reasons why we didn't choose Storyline. Had we had maybe six months to develop, maybe we could have used uh, Storyline, made it more linear, uh, and spent a little bit more time in the development piece of it. But we wanted to get something up and running. Uh, so part of it was writing the script, right? Those storytelling, that narrative piece, curating those resources, getting those images, uh, that custom designing and development that needed to happen, right? All of that is part of the, the time, as you all know, right? Uh, and then the cost, right? You know, we didn't have a huge budget, so we made something that was low cost, no cost as much as possible, uh, using free resources wherever possible or wherever we already had uh, access to things. Um, you know, consider that you may need some images, uh, 3D images. You can get the, you can probably Google stuff and get really creative. Like there was one instance where somebody is like, well, you know, I want to make it so like if they get it wrong, they go into like a dungeon. I'm like, well, we can find an image of a dungeon and we can say, hey, you, yeah, or maybe like a universe. So you're lost in space now, right? Like, you know, get creative with how you might use those pieces, right? Uh, there are uh, other tech that you can consider to use as well as personnel. So it's people and tech uh, to consider if you, if you need developers and stuff like that. And then, of course, 
logistics, right? I think that some kind of some of the questions that have came up, like, oh, did you do this individually or did you do this like in a group? We had them work in groups because we wanted them to collaborate and communicate amongst themselves. We thought that was essential for for the for the group uh, versus an individual where maybe it's more self-paced. So these are just kind of some considerations, right? Uh, and there is absolutely a difference between the face-to-face -face versus the virtual experience. Whereas we did this fully virtual, we once we got back uh, to campus, um, what we did, uh, so like this is our transition phase, right? Uh, we had them go in the, in rooms and we brought the laptop and we had it displayed on the screen. So they're in person and the collaboration and communication is happening in the group, but the, the platform itself is still digital and it's just being displayed on the screen. The next transition, right? The next iteration of that would be, okay, let's fully transition to in person where they're gonna rotate it through that room, right, where we set up the props or have multiple rooms where we have those props set up so they can interact with the actual pieces, the actual medication reconciliation list. I think what what serves well, no matter what, is that you have uh, a good story to tell and that that carries through. All right, last couple uh, of items here. Test and test again. As you saw, even though I had a demo already picked out, a lot of it didn't work. So, um, you know, test and test as many times as possible. And then, of course, nothing is perfect. There's always going to be a constraint or limitation to the software that you use. But I think the biggest piece of the testing is that it helps your faculty gain more confidence or whoever is actually going to be leveraging it, gain more confidence with the tech. Uh, and then the la my last takeaway is absolutely it takes a village. Get your diverse team of people that can offer the different uh, areas of, of expertise. Okay, so... Made it with three minutes to spare. Uh, if you have additional questions, let me just check the Q&A. What type of considerations for accessibility? Oh, great question, Deborah. So I think um, what we looked at for, and some of the stuff wasn't uh, as um, obvious at the time. I think I was initially just starting my accessibility initiative, uh, but I think that, you know, as using as much of the alt text possibilities as possible. We actually are moving away from kind of more of that drag and drop, you know, which was notorious, not accessible, right, uh, to providing more more alternatives. So I think that's our next uh, phase of, of of the escape room. But yeah, there, there are definitely things that we were learning as we were flying, as we were building the plane, so to speak. Um, but definitely at least there's alt text uh, as much as possible. And um, we're looking at what other alternatives might be. So we're not there yet right uh but we're we're trying to do better okay all right so i will share my uh references and resources for you guys here let me go ahead and drop that in the chat and if there's any last minute uh questions or comments i'm more than happy to answer that before we head out uh there is so this uh leads to a uh a google form let me escape here uh, if you have something that you want to share, uh, you can add it in the at the, at the end. Where'd you go? Here we go. Uh, these are all the references and resources that we use to kind of make the case for uh, escape rooms, right? Uh, and then the resources that we use, we use ThingLink, we use this particular camera, which is what we ended up purchasing. And then these are some of the uh, authoring tools that we used. Um, H5P, like I said, is theirs, link there as well. They do have a 360 um, tour that you can use as, as a way to develop that. Uh, and then let me know if you want to talk about anything else on that end. Woohoo. Okay. You're very, very, very welcome. If you have anything that you have learned or that you want to share, you're more than welcome to add it to the end there. Uh, it looks like a lot of digital tools used to build this tutorial. I'm curious to know how you manage the content updates. Yeah, yeah. So I, for it's very, you know, low tech. We meet up, you know, before the next iteration. What went well? What didn't? What didn't? What should we improve? And then, uh, in terms of project management, we use Teams. So the Teams planner. Um, we have like a Teams uh, channel, and then the planner within the Teams to kind of keep track of of the different different changes. It's it's not massive because we did a really good job. I think in the first, we took a lot of time in the beginning. Awesome. Okay. Tom, that is that is it for me. Thank you guys so much again for your, for your time. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. You see, here I am. I was saved. So <laughs> thank you. Really appreciate that. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you all. That's great. Happy yeah. Yeah. Happy falls and enjoy the rest of the day. Goodbye, everybody.